Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. So in this crash course video, I'm going to touch on the subject of the great apostasy. What exactly is it and are we living in the times of the great apostasy foretold in the Bible and reiterated by our church fathers? We know that the church will have to undergo the same passion that Christ did before it is gloriously resurrected again. What exactly does that mean? And what is its connection to the third secret of Fatima? All right, so let's take a look. Please remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, we see that before the great day of the Lord comes, the apostasy must come first. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except the apostasy comes first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now the Catechism of the Catholic Church states, Before Christ's second coming, the Church must pass through a final trial that would shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in the place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Apostasy from the Greek word Apostasia means a defiance of an established system or authority, a rebellion, an abandonment, or breach of faith. Now for this, let us turn to facts and the warnings of our Blessed Mother and many saints and mystics of the Church. On June 29, 1972, Pope St. Paul VI said, quote, We would say that through some mysterious crack, no, it's not mysterious, through some crack, the smoke of Satan has entered the church of God. There is doubt, uncertainty, problems, unrest, dissatisfaction, confrontation. It was thought that after the council, which was Vatican II, sunny days would come for the history of the church. Nevertheless, what came were days of clouds, of storms, of darkness, of searching, of uncertainty. We tried to dig abysses instead of covering them." End quote. Now, on October 13, 1977, he said, quote, The tale of the devil is functioning in the disintegration of the Catholic world. The darkness of Satan has entered and spread throughout the Catholic Church, even up to its summit. Apostasy, the loss of the faith, is spreading throughout the world and into the highest levels within the Church. End quote. Now, in an interview, the Pope Paul VI gave to his close friend Jean Gooden not long before he died. Gooden asked the Pope about his often quoted remark regarding the smoke of Satan. The Pope replied, quote, Yes, the smoke of Satan is in the sanctuary. Due to the presence of Satan, Catholics are destined to become an infinite simile small part of humanity. End quote. Now, what would be the reasoning for Satan to enter into the church? What does he gain from doing this? His main and ultimate goal is to destroy Christ, to remove him and the worship of him from every part of society that he can, to destroy the church that Christ himself created, and to sit at the highest point of that church. Now I want you to listen to this clip from Father Malachi Martin from a 1996 interview with Art Bell. For those who don't know Father Martin, he was an exorcist and advisor to three popes, a renowned author, and is said to have known the true third secret of Fatima. He describes what's happening to the Catholic Church. Take a listen. All right, now, Malachi Martin, eminent theologian, expert on the Roman Catholic Church, former Jesuit professor at the Vatican's Pontifical Biblical Institute, is the author of such widely acclaimed national bestsellers as The Final Conclave, Vatican, The Jesuits, The Keys of This Blood, um, the most recent of his books, actually that's not quite true, uh, long acknowledged uh, as 
the premier authority on the subject of possession and exorcism, Malachi Martin is justly celebrated as a, quote, writer of fiery brilliance, end quote. That was the Detroit News, whose, quote, work catches the light like rare Waterford crystal, Baltimore Evening Sun. Malachi Martin is a familiar figure to millions of you who welcome and speak with him often during his frequent and outspoken radio and television appearances. That's putting it mildly. I'm holding in my hand his book, Hostage to the Devil. Uh, it documents the possession and exorcism of five Americans. I believe his latest book is actually Windswept House, or maybe not, but I know it is just now coming out in paperback. Father Martin, welcome to the program. Good morning, Art, and thank you very much for having me. It is, it's a real pleasure. Uh, it is. It's great to have you here, sir. Uh, um, we don't do it frequently enough. Uh, is that correct? Is, is Windswept House the most recent of your yes, books? Yes, it is. It's just, as you say, it's just coming out in paperback. Okay. And uh, it is my most recent, yes. All right. Windswept House, I have not had an opportunity to read yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's my understanding that it's kind of a... How would you describe it as a... Uh, as sort of a... <laughs> Expose of the of the Vatican. Yes, of the condition of the the prelacy, the governors, the the cardinals and bishops that govern this vast one billion plus member uh, church, the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. It is uh, it is a, a study of the condition of that organization as a world organization for spreading its. Uh, gospel, it's faith. Uh, is there a way that you can sort of give us a nutshell uh, version of what you consider to be the condition of the church today? Yes, there is. And um, let nobody sort of uh, cavil at it in the, wrong, in the difficult sense or the painful sense of the word, but listen to it because it seems to correspond with reality. And after all, in the matter of faith and religion, uh, it is a matter of attaining what is there, for, uh, the real. It is this, that the, the book really says, look, as far as organization goes, as an institution and an organization, the vast Roman Catholic Church is on the down slope. It is losing steadily and heavily, and uh, ab- uh, over two-thirds of its members, that's two-thirds of one billion people, uh, are being led into a form of belief which is irreconcilable with the traditional essence and uh, outlook and belief of the Roman Catholic Church as it has been put almost two millennia. In what way? For over 30 years, the majority of the governors, the directors, the managers of this organization have been feeding a form of belief which is not Catholic, which has made compromises on basic doctrines and uh, which therefore have led this faithful astray to their beliefs. Okay, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the apparitions of Fatima, Portugal. The Blessed Mother appeared to three shepherd children in 1917. She revealed three secrets to them, two of which are known. Um, I did a crash course video dissecting and kind of breaking down the second secret. I will put that video in the description box below. Now, the third secret was written down by Sister Lucia, who was the main seer. It was placed in an envelope and sealed, and it, it was then given to her bishop with strict instructions that the envelope must not be opened until 1960 or upon her death, whichever came first. It was then given to Pope John the Twenty-Third, who decided not to reveal its contents. And on June 26, 2000, Pope St. John Paul II revealed for the first time the supposed contents of the secret. What was revealed was a vision that the children had received from the Blessed Mother in 1917, but nothing else. 
and I'll get um, I'll go into more detail on that in a moment. So this is what was revealed to the world. Quote, I write in obedience to you, my God, who commanded me to do so through his excellency, the Bishop of Lyria, and through your most holy mother and mine. After the two parts, which I have already explained, at the left of Our Lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Flashing, it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire, but they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance, penance, penance. And we saw in an immense light that is God something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, men and women religious were going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross of rough hewn trunks as of a cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city half in ruins, and half trembling with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the soul of, corp of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. And the same way there died one after another, the other bishops, priests, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross were two angels, each with a crystal, crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God." End quote. Now, in the same interview in 1996, the Father Malachi Martin on the, had on the Art Bell show, Art Bell had a listener call in, revealing that he heard the contents of the third secret from um, a Jesuit priest. Take a listen. All right, here we go. Um, just a couple of things I want to quickly read. One from a friend in Australia, Father, yes. uh, who says, I had a Jesuit priest tell me more of the third secret of Fatima years ago in Perth. Uh, he said, among other things, the last pope would be under control of Satan. Pope John fainted, thinking it might be him. We were interrupted before I could hear the rest. Um, any comment on that? Yes. Uh, it sounds as if they were reading or um, being told the text of the third secret. Oh, my. It sounds like it. Father Malachi Martin also said, quote, I was shown a copy of the Third Secret at the time Pope John XXIII opened it and sought the advice of a group of cardinals in 1960. One of those cardinals was, was Augustine Cardinal B, and I was his assistant. The apostasy in the Church forms the backdrop or the contents of the Third Secret. The apostasy is just beginning now. But the chastisements foretold in the secret are very real, physical chastisements, and they are terrible. He then related the exchange he had with Cardinal B when the Cardinal emerged from the meeting with Pope John XXIII that he was holding with his advisors. He said that the Cardinal B looked very pale, so he asked him, quote, What's wrong, Your Eminence? Cardinal B said, We've just killed a billion people. Look at this. He then handed Father Malachi Martin the sheet of paper with the 25 lines of handwriting. Father Malachi Martin said, Since that day, every word of this text has been imprinted indelibly in my mind. Cardinal B. had made the statement about a billion people because the Pope had just made the decision not to release the third secret of Fatima and not to consecrate Russia. In his book, The Keys of This Blood, Father Malachi Martin lists the categories of the secret. He says it is, one, a physical chastisement of the nations involving catastrophes, man-made or natural, on land, on water, and in the atmosphere of the globe. Two, 
a spiritual chastisement consisting of the disappearance or religious belief, a period of widespread unfaith in many countries. And three, a central function of Russia in two preceding series of events. He said, in fact, the physical and spiritual chastisements, according to Lucia's letters, are to be gridded on a fateful timetable in which Russia is the ratchet. Now I will go into details on the aspect of um, Russia in the secret in another video. Father Malachi Martin had mentioned Pope John the Twenty Third. Now this was also confirmed by Father Gabriel Amorth. Father Gabriel Amorth was a Vatican exorcist and was a close personal friend of Padre Pio. He knew Saint Padre Pio for about twenty six years, and it is from him that he claims to have learned the contents of the Third Secret of Fatima. Father Amorth was interviewed by Jose Maria Zavala for his book entitled The Best Kept Secret of Fatima. Now this interview was also published in an article by 1 Peter 5. There are a series of questions that Zavala asked and then he reverted back to the topic of Fatima where he said, Forgive me for insisting on the Third Secret of Fatima. Did Padre Pio relate it then to the loss of faith within the Church? Father Gabriel furrows his brow and sticks out his chin. He seems very affected. Indeed, he states, one day Padre Pio said to me very sorrowfully, You know, Gabriel, it is Satan who has been introduced into the bosom of the church and within a very short time will come to rule a false church. Oh my God, some kind of antichrist. When did he prophesy this to you? Zavala asked. Father Amorth replied, it must have been about 1960 since I was already a priest then. Was that why John the Twenty-Third had such a panic about publishing the Third Secret of Fatima, so that the people wouldn't think that he was the anti-pope or whatever it was? asked Zavala. A slight but knowing smile curls the lip of Father Amorth. Did Padre Pio say anything else to you about future catastrophes? earthquakes, floods, wars, epidemic, or hunger? Did he allude to the same plagues prophesied in Holy Scriptures? asked Zavala. Nothing of the sort mattered to him, however terrifying they proved to be, except for the great apostasy within the Church. This was the issue that really tormented him, and for which he prayed and offered a great part of his suffering, crucified out of love, says Father Amorth. The third secret of Fatima, Asavala, exactly. Now many who have read the actual contents of the third secret state that it was not fully revealed in the year 2000, that there is more to the supposed vision that was given to the world. Here are five examples to prove that. Number one, Archbishop Capovilla, who was the personal secretary to Pope John XXIII, stated that there are two texts, two envelopes. He also revealed the locations of where the texts were placed. In his testimony, he said that the vision was placed in the Barbarigo desk in the papal apartment and that the text was placed in a safe, something to which the Vatican has not denied to this day. Number two, Pope John XXIII had himself confirmed the reading of two different messages by his need for a translator for one of the messages as he knew some Portuguese, but was not affluent in the language. Number three. Spokesman for Pope John, the um, Pope John Paul II, Joaquin Navarro Valls, revealed in the year 2000 that back in 1978, shortly after his papacy, the Pope read two different messages in his company and in the company of a few other witnesses. Number four. In her memoir, Sister Lucia wrote it as, quote, In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. End quote. Now, many of those who have read the Third Secret have revealed that the true Third Secret begins with those very words. Father Alonso, who was a Fatima archivist and who had interviewed Sister Lucia, said, quote, The phrase most clearly implies a critical state of faith, which other nations will suffer a crisis of faith, whereas Portugal will preserve its faith. In periods preceding the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, 
terrible things are going to happen. If in Portugal the dogma of the faith will be preserved, it can clearly be deduced that in other parts of the church, those dogmas are going to become obscure or even lost altogether. Thus, it is quite possible that the text makes concrete references to the crisis of faith in the church and to the negligence of the pastors themselves. End quote. Number five. Some Fatima experts have pointed out that the published text contains no words of Our Lady, even though the Vatican itself, when it announced the suppression of the secret back in 1960, referred to, quote, the words which Our Lady confided as a secret to the three little shepherds. So the document's for format on four sheets of paper does not correspond to the single sheet sealed in the envelope that Sister Lucia gave to her bishop in 1944. So, I guess we can deduce that the published document is the second part of the secret, the part that Father Schweigel said, quote, concerns the Pope. The first part, the letter sealed by Sister Lucia and kept for a long time in the safe, in the papal apartment, has still not been revealed. When confronted on this point by a German-speaking friend of the Pope, Pope Benedict XVI admitted that the published version of the secret, the vision with the bishop dressed in white, is truly not all of the third secret. End quote. Fatima.org reveals that, quote, In 1960, the Holy See imposed some very strict conditions of isolation on Sister Lucia. The very same year that the third secret was to be revealed to the world and wasn't. From 1960 up until the, de the time of her death in 2005, Sister Lucia had been forbidden to speak about Fatima without direct permission from the Holy See. For 45 years, she had not been allowed to share the truth about Fatima. The full message delivered by Our Lady, a message of warning and of hope for the entire world, has been to this very day hidden from mankind. Yet, on several occasions, Sister Lucia seemed to indicate what the third part of the secret contained. In these statements, Sister Lucia speaks of the devil gaining power over some priests and bishops and other consecrated souls. She speaks of the diabolic disorientation infecting the upper hierarchy. These were truly explosive revelations. Perhaps it is because Sister Lucia spoke too clearly that she had been silenced." End quote. What were these revelations? Well, as in a series of letters to her bishop, Sister Lucia wrote, quote, It is indeed sad that so many people let themselves be dominated by the diabolical wave that is sweeping the world and that they are blinded to the point of being incapable of seeing error. Their principal fault is that they have abandoned prayer. In this way, they have become estranged from God, and without God, everything fails. The devil is very cunning and looks for our weak points in order to attack us. If we are not diligent and careful to obtain strength from God, we shall fall, for our age is very wicked and we are weak. Only the strength of God can keep us on our feet. Let people say the rosary every day. Our Lady stated that repeatedly in her apparitions, as if to fortify us against these times of diabolical disorientation so that we will not allow ourselves to be deceived by false doctrines. Unfortunately, the great majority of people are ignorant in religious matters and allow themselves to be led in any direction, hence the great responsibility of one who has the task of leading them. A, dis a diabolical disorientation is invading the world, deceiving souls. It must be resisted. Now, in these letters, she also had strong words about the leadership in the church following Vatican II. She wrote in 1970 to Mother Martins, who was a former companion with the Dorothean sisters. She said, quote, It is painful to see such a great disorientation in so many who occupy places of responsibility. The devil has succeeded in infiltrating evil under the cover of good and the blind are beginning to guide others as the Lord tells us in his gospel 
and souls are letting themselves be deceived, end quote. In 1960, Our Lady's Messenger found herself forced to keep to a rigorous silence about heaven's demands, which were addressed to the hierarchy, but which were cast aside by them. Cardinal Pacelli, who later became Pope Pius XII in the 1930s, wrote, quote, I am concerned about the confidences of the Virgin to the little Lucia Fatima, the persistence of the good lady in face of the danger that threatens the church is a divine warning against the suicide that the modification of the faith, liturgy, theology, and soul of the church would represent. I hear around me partisans of novelties who want to demolish the holy sanctuary, destroy the universal flame of the church, reject her adornments, and make her remorseful for her historical past. Well, my dear friend, I am convinced that the Church of Peter must affirm her past, or else she will dig her own tomb." End quote. Now we are seeing all this all around us today, with the restrictions and forced closures of the traditional Latin Mass. On another occasion, when Sister Lucia was asked what the third secret entailed, she replied, quote, it is in the Gospel, and it is in the Book of the Apocalypse, chapter 12 and 13. Read them." End quote. Twice, Pope St. John Paul II linked the secret to the Book of Revelations. In the year 2000, he referenced the tale of the dragon dragging the stars down from heaven, which is Revelation chapter 12, verses 4. It says, His tail swept a third of the stars from the sky, tossing them to the earth. Pope John Paul said this is interpreted as the dragon or falling away of consecrated souls away from God because of corruption and loss of faith, end quote. Cardinal Mario Giappi, who was the personal papal theologian to Popes John XXIII, Pope Paul VI, Pope John Paul I, and Pope John Paul II, said, quote, The third secret foretold, among other things, that the great apostasy in the church will begin at the top. End quote. On March 17, 1990, Cardinal Odi said to Italian journalist Lucio Brunelli in the journal Il Sabato, quote, It, the third secret, has nothing to do with Gorbachev. The Blessed Virgin was alerting us against apostasy in the Church. End quote. Henry Edward Cardinal Manning, who was an English prelate of the Roman Catholic Church and the second Archbishop of Westminster from 1865, until his death in 1892, said, quote, Rome shall apostatize from the faith, drive away the vicar of Christ, and return to its ancient paganism. Then the church shall be scattered, driven into the wilderness, and shall be for a time, as it was in the beginning, invisible, hidden in the catacombs, in dens, mountains, in lurking places. For a time it shall be swept, as if it were from the face of the earth. Such is the universal testimony of the fathers of the early church." End quote. The Blessed Mother revealed to Father Gobi, whose writings have the imprimatur and who have been approved by Pope St. John Paul II on November 20, 1976, quote, Satan has now pitched his tent even among the ministers of the sanctuary and has brought the abomination of desolation into the holy place of God, end quote. On August 26, 1983, she said, quote, Error is being taught and propagated beneath the ambiguous formulas of a new cultural interpretation of the truth. The spirit of the world finds welcome. The apostasy has now spread into every part of the church, betrayed even by some of its, some of its bishops, abandoned by many of its priests, deserted by many of its children, and violated by my adversary." End quote. And again on September 6, 1985, she said, quote, There is also enter entered into the church disunity, division, strife, and antagonism. These are the times foretold by me, when cardinals will be set against cardinals, bishops against bishops, and priests against priests, and the flock of Christ will be torn to pieces by rapacious wolves who have found their way in under the clothing of defenseless and meek lambs. 
Among them, there are even some who occupy posts of great responsibility, and by means of them, Satan has succeeded in entering and operating at the very summit of the church. End quote. Now the Blessed Mother warned Aquito Ecuador in 1610 of what will occur in the 20th century, 400 years before. Now I encourage you, if you are not familiar with that apparition, to research it, and I will post a link to a video that I did as well in the description box below. Here is part of her message to Mother Mariana de Jesus. She said, quote, The Catholic spirit will rapidly decay. The precious light of the faith will gradually be extinguished. Added to this will be the effects of secular education, which will be one reason for the death of priestly and religious vocations. The sacrament of holy orders will be ridiculed, oppressed, and despised. The devil will try to persecute the ministers of the Lord in every possible way. He will labor with cruel and subtle astuteness to deviate them from the spirit of vocation and will corrupt many of them. These depraved priests who will scandalize the Christian people will make the hatred of bad Catholics and the enemies of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church fall upon all priests." Now let me stop for a minute. This message was in the the 1600s. With all of the scandals of sexual abuse in the church and the hatred for the priests and the church that have grown as a result of that, if you can't see that this is truly a message for our times, then I don't know what to say. Our Lady continues, quote, Also for the church, a time of her greatest trials will come. Cardinals will oppose cardinals, bishops will oppose bishops, and Satan will march amid their ranks. And in Rome, great changes will occur. What is rotten will fall, and what will fall will never rise again. The church will be darkened, and the world will be deranged by terror. But in the meantime, the church will be obscured, and the world deranged by terror will be taken in by errors made by the partisans of Satan, who for a while will be able to reign over the world until God will again be proclaimed and served as before. During this period, the church will suffer persecution, in part by Freemasonry and a horrible notorious internal crisis caused by the betrayal of many ministers of God who would join the party of Satan by becoming members of the Masonic Lodges." Now Our Lady is consistent with her messages. At La Salette, France, she told the two children, Melanie and Maxim, that the church will be in eclipse, which echoes her phrase to Mother Mariana that the church will be darkened. Also at La Salette, she warned that Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. At Akita, Japan, she used the same wording. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals and bishops opposing bishops. The church will be full of those who accept compromises, and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. End quote. Now, since the 1960s, religion and the belief in God has been on the decline. Now, just a note, Vatican II um, began in 1961. According to religionnews.com, they say, quote, The graph of this index tells the story of the rise and fall of religious activity. During the post-war, baby booming 1950s, there was a revival of religion. Indeed, indeed some at the time considered it a third great awakening. Then came the societal changes of the 1960s, which included a questioning of religious institutions. The resulting decline in religion stopped by the end of the 1970s when religiosity remained steady. Over the past 15 years, however, religion has once again declined. But this decline is much sharper than the the decline of 1960s and 1970s. Church attendance and prayer is less frequent. The number of people with no religion is growing, and fewer people say that religion is an important part of their lives. All measures point to the same drop in religion. If the 1950s were a, another great awakening, then this is a great decline. End quote. We saw before where Father Malachi Martin stated that the people are being led into a form of belief which isn't Catholic, 
we were also warned of the modernization of the church and the changing of doctrines which have been around since Christ. Therefore, Satan is setting up what they call a counter-church. What does that mean? Pope St. John Paul II said, quote, We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the Antichrist, end quote. The apostasy began with the onset of Vatican II, which took place, like I said, from 1962, um, I believe it was 1962 to 1965. And I did touch on the errors of Vatican II in a previous video, and I'm also working on a video regarding the infiltration into the church. But it's not hard to see that since then, there has been a decline in faith in the seminary and in the belief of Christ. The devil has succeeded in convincing people that he does not exist, that there are no consequences for your actions, and that we are our own gods. In his 1948 radio program, Archbishop Fulton Sheen prophesied about the counterfeit Catholic Church. Now pay close attention to his words and see the truth and the reality of the times that we are living in now. He said, quote, Satan will set up a counter-church, which will be the ape of the Catholic Church. It will have all the notes and characteristics of the Church, but in reverse and emptied of its divine content. We are living in the days of the Apocalypse, the last days of our era. The two great forces, the mystical body of Christ and the mystical body of the Antichrist, are beginning to draw battle lines for the catastrophic contest. The false prophet will have a religion without a cross, a religion without a world to come, a religion to destroy religions. There will be a counterfeit church. Christ's church, the Catholic church, will be one, and the false prophet will create the other. The false church will be worldly, ecumenical, and global. It will be a loose federation of churches and religions, forming some type of global association. A world parliament of churches, it will be emptied of all divine content. It will be the mystical body of the Antichrist. The mystical body on earth today will have its Judas Iscariot, and he will be the false prophet. Satan will recruit him from our bishops. The Antichrist will not be so called, otherwise he would have no followers. He will not wear red tights, nor vomit sulfur nor carry a trident, nor wave an arrow tail as Mephistopheles in Faust. This masquerade has helped the devil convince man that he does not exist. When no man recognizes, the more power he exercises. God has defined, defined himself as I am who I am, and the devil as I am who am not. Nowhere in sacred scripture do we find warrant for the popular myth of the devil as a buffoon who is dressed like the first red. Rather, he is described as an angel fallen from heaven, as the prince of this world, whose business it is to tell us that there is no other world. His logic is simple. If there is no hevel, heaven, there is no hell. If there is no hell, there is no sin. If there is no sin, then there is no judge. And if there is no judgment, then evil is good and good is evil. But above all these descriptions, our Lord tells us that he will be so much like himself that he would deceive even the elect. And certainly no devil ever seen in picture books could deceive even the elect. How will he come in this new age to win followers to his religion? The pre-communist Russian belief is that he will come disguised as a great humanitarian. He will talk peace, prosperity, and plenty, not as means to lead us to God, but as ends in themselves. The third temptation in which Satan asked Christ to adore him and all the kingdoms of the world would be his will become the temptation to have a new religion without a cross, a liturgy without a world to come, a religion to destroy a religion, or a politics which is a religion, one that renders unto Caesar even things that are God's. In the midst of all his seeming love for humanity and his glib talk of freedom and equality, he will have one great secret which he will tell to no one. He will not believe in God, because a religion will be brotherhood without the fatherhood of God. He will deceive even the elect. 
he will set up a counter church, which will be the ape of the church because he, the devil, is the ape of God. It will have all the notes and characteristics of the church, but in reverse and emptied of its divine content. It will be a mystical body of the Antichrist that will in all externals resemble the mystical body of Christ. But the 20th century will join the counter church because it claims to be infallible when its visible head speaks ex cathedra from Moscow on the subject of economics and politics and as chief shepherd of world communism. End quote. Once again, our Blessed Mother has come to warn us. In this time of the great apostasy, it is imperative that we stick with the true magisterium of the Church, which I will cover in another video, and not be fooled by the wolves in sheep's clothing. Our Lord said that even the elect will be fooled. Let's keep our eyes fixated on God, ask Him for the special grace of discernment, so that we are not led astray, but stand firm in His teachings, which cannot be changed. Remember, it is not the Church itself, but the deception, and as Sister Lucia Fatima stated, the diabolical disorientation which has taken place. You are fooling yourself if you think that the devil does not exist or that we are not fighting against principalities and powers. Please wake up before it's too late. So with all of these accounts and information, it is clear that the Blessed Mother, in the Third Secret, was warning about apostasy the great apostasy foretold in sacred scripture. The church will be betrayed by its enemies. The true church, which Christ built, is going through the same passion that Christ did, but the gates of hell will never prevail, and it will arise more glorious than ever. In these times of confusion, let's remember the words of Pope Benedict XV in his encyclical, Ad Beatissimi Apostolorum. He said, quote, the Catholic faith is such that nothing can be added to it, nothing taken away. It, it is either held in its entirety or it is rejected totally. And let nothing be introduced, only what has been handed down. End quote. Thank you for watching. God bless you and as always, to Jesus, through Mary.